good afternoon, everybody. Nice to have you all joining us. Um, it's afternoon here in South Africa. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. I think it's around about one in in the UK. And um, Jenny, you would have to tell us what time it is on your side. Um, welcome for setting aside the time for this uh, fourth um, uh, seminar in the um, webinar series. Um, we are excited to have you all join us. Uh, in this webinar, we're looking at graduates, the knowledge, the society, and we are reflecting on a seven-year study of the educational outcomes of science and engineering. It's been a privilege to be part of, of this substantial study. It's a rare opportunity one gets for a solid longitudinal study, well-funded, fabulous support. And, um, and it is something where we, I certainly learned so much about collaboration, about constructing a large study and the careful meticulous work that has gone into this. So we are very excited to have our um, two principal investigators, Paul Ashwin, from the Department of Educational Research at Lancaster University, who has been the lead researcher on this project, and uh, Jenny Case, who is, is based at the Department of Engineering Education at Virginia Tech. And um, we, we really look forward to this presentation. Before we start, just a few um, housekeeping notices. Um, as you know, this is a, a, a recorded uh, seminar and it will be made available on the site uh, at a later stage soon after this I believe and then just um, our usual kind of housekeeping rules suggesting that you select the speaker view in the top right hand corner of your screen that you ask your questions in the chat um, I'll be watching out for those and maybe sort of call on people as the as the questions come up, please keep yourselves muted unless you are speaking. And if you are willing, please switch on your video. It would be nice to see you all. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul. Thanks, Paul. We look forward to this presentation. So actually, Renee, um, I've got the great pleasure of kicking things off in this double header with me and my good colleague, Paul Ashwin. And um, welcome, everybody. I've just looked at the participant list. What a great joy to see uh, a lot of familiar names and people who've been part of this journey in various ways. Um, and this is the fourth in a series of um, four webinars where we've had the privilege to get the CG sta stage to reflect on this project. And I just asked Paul ahead of this, remind me again when we actually started cooking up this whole scheme. And it was 2014, so it's exactly 10 years ago. I remember some very exciting discussions when Paul said we may have this opportunity to be part of this huge bid that is being made. Um, by CG and and we thereafter got the permission and the funding to get going. So I'm going to kick off our seminar today where the, the two of us will reflect back on, on this project for which Paul was the PI based at Lancaster. Myself, I was at the University of Cape Town at, when the project commenced. I've retained an honorary professorship there and I am now at Virginia Tech, and that's part of my story on this project too. <laughs> so firstly, just to acknowledge the broader team, and here we um, reference the project that this really had two stages. The second part came up with this wonderful acronym of GEEK as we moved into researching students um, into the graduate and um, post-graduation stage. You will hear more details, but I just want to acknowledge the full team in the UK, Paul, Jan MacArthur, um, Kaylee Rosewell, Dee Daglish, all at Lancaster. The South African team, Mags Blackie, who's now at Rhodes, Renee Smith at UCT, Ashish was a postdoc at UCT at the time of the study, is now at Rochester 
Institute for Technology. And then the US team, myself, my colleague Nicole Peterson, and then um, two people, Ella Abdallah and Benjamin Goldschneider, who were PhD students at the time of the project and did really important work. And um, Ella is now in a postdoc at Eindhoven and, and Ben is at University of Virginia. So it's also just been wonderful to work with this team. It's been a seven year study. And um, as noted, this is the GEEK study. The first study we called UKSA, Understanding Knowledge and Student Agency. Also very cleverly put in together two country acronyms. I think, Paul, that was your um, genius. So we landed up having um, over 80 students that we had attracted um, and managed to every year. Too, um, and, and then the Geek study took over 70 students across all these sites. You'll hear more from me on that in a moment. So with no further ado, then I think I've said that already, really with no further ado, some reflections. So I'm going to kick off just some discussions around some theoretical and methodological reflections. It was a great joy to be planning this seminar with Paul over a beer in London recently ahead of the big final CG conference as well. So one really Im very important and interesting aspect of the study is that we were tremendously influenced by a study led by Moni Monica McLean um, at Nottingham and Andrea Abbas um, Bath, and Paul was on that as well. A lot of publications out of this project, which was looking at sociology students across a range of different institutions in the UK. And... A, a striking finding from this project was that discipline really knowledge for undergraduates is the central determinant of what they land up as at the end of the degrees, much more so, sorry to say, than institutional rankings and in some institutions being considered higher status than others. This was a very very in-depth study which aimed to show what do students get from their degrees. So the really interesting question um, that you know Paul brought to us was, well, what if we go to STEM? <laughs> and we asked the same question, um, maybe in a slightly different way, but you know, what do what do students get from their degrees? Um now, a lot of this work, understandably, has happened in humanities and social science and maybe STEM being science, technology, engineering and mathematics might seem pretty obvious. You know, they're getting trained for these professions and they learn in science and engineering knowledge. Um, but what we already were starting to see, actually, there's a lot of scope for exploring um, science and engineering students. And so and uh, any um, sort of scientists or education researchers in the room will know that. Nothing is self-evident. So as Rene already mentioned, it's rare to get a, a, this kind of funding to go over seven years, it turned out, across the two grants and to be working across what led up to be three countries. Um, an incredibly fantastic opportunity for all of us who are involved. So I want to just flag um, what I think were really structuring decisions at the outset. Um, and, and a really key thing is the team that Paul drew around him for this project. Um, you can see that we have introduced ourselves as the South Africa, the UK, and the US team, but you already see there's quite a lot of movement in terms of where people started where they landed up so a lot of us are people with experience in more than one context but really importantly a lot of comparative work would have said to the South Africa team off you go you know here's some questions maybe some protocols please do the study and then we'll have a book maybe where there's a chapter that the South African team says here's the case study so we wanted to use the opportunity of this funding to do something maybe a little bit more ambitious. And with ambition always comes a risk of failure, I will acknowledge, but we wanted this crossover. So across the analysis, what, you know, the collecting of the data obviously was driven quite a lot within the teams who were on the ground and busy get, you know, um, gaining relationships with the departments where we were making connections with students. 
But particularly at the analysis phase, we constructed ourselves into teams looking at themes that were all very cross-national. And then many of our analysis, we actually said, hey, I'm, you know, if I was the person in one of those teams, I'm going to look, I'm going to do the slice of the English data because I don't know that context. And this famous um, adage that many of us have tried to do in education research, making the familiar unfamiliar, I think it was a huge asset in the project. So as you may know already, especially those of you who've maybe attended some of the other webinars, um, the core data set were these annual interviews with the students. I want to acknowledge we also did, um, uh, in each year, we always had a class where we went to meet with the lecturer and we videoed a class and we had an interview with the lecturer there. After that was really important contextual data. We had curriculum data. We had interviews also with those that led the programs at the start and crucially at the exit. You heard from Jan on that. But um, I think it's still true to say the core of the study rests on the on the data with students. And, you know, students have got a lot of things in their lives. So it, a really key thing was to maintain these relationships. And I really want to credit the people who did the bulk of the interviewing, being Kaylee, Ben, Allah, and Ashish and the team and some other people we drew in as well. And then very importantly, we started with a very large group of first years. We down selected to second years. In the second year, we had 10 students in each program. And so you can see there's a lot of attrition if you do the math quickly down to the very final group. Um, and I think this is important maybe to model for other people who might think of a project like this. Understandably, our second year was quite a, dis a purpose of selection. For those who may not be familiar with that term, we obviously were looking for maximum diversity, read in very many ways with uh, each group of students. But then there is obviously a selection effect when, um, in terms of who stays with the project. And that's something that we've worked with in our analysis. Theoretically, there's so much to say on this. It could be a seminar on its own. Um, but I think the key thing broadly, we social, social realists when we come to looking at student learning, teaching and higher education. Um, that means the social context matters. It means ontologically, it's not only about people's perceptions, but also this real world in which they're functioning. Um, but I said, I think really importantly, agnostically beyond that. So we actually drew in, for example, Jan MacArthur brought a lot of critical um, perspectives to the study that I think really enriched it. And basically we used theoretical tools as we needed them in terms of what the data was telling us. So I would want to say maybe um, elements of grounded theory certainly informed how we approach our data. And then just maybe to emphasize again, the team, and here I did have a point, I didn't put it in the slides because Paul would have balked, but I want to shout out Paul's leadership here. And I've just learned so much about leading a team. And, you know, we are um, a range of academic experiences from PhD students to professors and everybody in between, um, different disciplines. So they're social scientists and um, people who are maybe more trained in science and engineering in the broad team and a very wide range of nationalities that go even beyond these three countries. So um, the key thing I want to say about Paul's leadership is the respect for everyone and the non-hierarchical basis with which we've worked with each other has been quite extraordinary. And I, I just, it's modeled a sense of leadership for me. Okay, I'm going to stop on that point because Paul has just about squirmed off the screen, but I, I know that everybody else, you're welcome to put little thumbs ups in your chat. Um, those of you who've been on the team, I know you um, will echo that. So here to talk about constructing the case, and here's a diagram I, I've always been very proud of that I made, but no one else picked it up. So I'm giving it another run because I want to think in my head, I think about what's what's going on here. So You've got the um, comparative piece reflected across these six institutions. They've got these very cool um, pseudonyms, which are the first letter is telling you whether it's English, South African, 
or American, and apologies, we went A there. Obviously, it's United States, and I appreciate the Americas is not just the northern continent, but at any rate, A worked for Argonne and stuff. Um, and then you can see, we ha so we have these six institutions. In each institution, we have both a chemistry and a chemical engineering program, more on that shortly. And we have four years normally of, of the bachelor's degree, really crucially, of course, and this is where my diagram falls down, the um, English degrees were three-year degrees. So after three years, those students were actually either in the workplace or in graduate studies, but my for simplicity. So there we've got our students in each program and they were, um, there's also, I told you, there were actually more in first year. I'm sure I thought we were going to have 10 students all along. I'm a huge optimist. So as I said, there was some very natural attrition, but basically we were following them through the four years. And that was phase one, the UXA project, Understanding Knowledge and Student Agency. And then just such a privilege to get more funding through CG to carry on for another three years. And so we followed them for three years post-graduation. And, and Kaylee Rosewell played a very key role in, in particularly maintaining relationships over <laughs> seven years, picking up with people who'd maybe been interviewed elsewhere by other people in South Africa and the US. Um, moving on then just a little bit more on, on this point about the construction of the case study. So, and maybe, I don't know if this is kind of like, I want to say I've always thought research, you must do a lot of planning up front, but then you get opportunities or we could call them challenges. So the challenge was that the year after we started and I was an international partner with CG based in um, South Africa, I moved to a position in the US um, and, and, and we put our heads together and decided let's build a US site. It was a great joy that Nicole Peterson then an assistant professor in my department got excited about the project and really ran with leading the U.S. site. I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, in the U.S., you will appreciate we do funding tends to be a very big thing that people talk about. So Nicole put a lot of time around a project that was did not have U.S.-based funding coming to it. Um, but we made it work, and I appreciate the generosity, again, of Paul and Lancaster in supporting us in the U.S. to have this work. And also just to acknowledge we did manage to get additional funding from the National Research Foundation in South Africa. So what I want to say to people, yeah, um, you know, be bold in your ambitions and and be flexible also when opportunities arise. Um I think this was a very big challenge for us was how to select the two universities. Um, you know, initially, I, th I think a very important thing coming out of the UK project that um, Monica McLean, Andrea and Paul had run, we were thinking about rankings and we did want to have the sort of contrast of rankings, you know, maybe more research focused institution and then another one that was maybe a little bit different in, in the food chain in that country. And, and I mean, obviously not surprising, and this is what's such interest about comparative studies, the other two countries, it wasn't easy to get that sort of match. Um, and so we end up really thinking about a contrast. We wanted institutions that had different missions and maybe to some degree attracted different students for different reasons, and we did get that. Um, and so, you know, again, an acknowledgement to all the programs who agree to work with us, give us access to students and so on. And then um, the thing that I, I know might be a puzzlement, <laughs> why chemistry and chemical engineering? And um, yeah, you may want to know, it's, I mean, my first degree is in chemistry and then I taught in chemical engineering. So I was um, I was excited at this idea, but it's not only that I got to foist my views on everyone. I think what we saw, and, and, and Irene also really explored this in her PhD, these are very interesting disciplines in terms of um, science and engineering disciplines that are pretty close in how they've evolved in terms of what their discipline base was. 
And so our feeling was, if we really want to test out, does disciplinary knowledge um, have an impact? Let's choose two degrees that are very close to each other. And let's see, do they produce graduates who are quite similar or, or are they quite different? That's a really big question that has driven the study. And, and I think as I hand over to Paul, you most were going to hear um, some of the answers on that. So Paul, over to you. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Jenny. Um, can you see my slides? Um, yeah, <clears throat> great. So, so thanks, Jenny. And 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 you know, as as you, you may have got from on the presentation, Jenny did. Jenny played a really key role in bringing people into the team. Um, it was, you know, it's it's a wonderful team to work with. Um, lots of great people, and some some came um with me from Lancaster. And I've worked with before, and I've worked with Jenny before. But, but in terms of the South African teams and, and the teams in the US, um, Jenny was absolutely key in bringing those brilliant people in. So I just wanted to recognize that. Um, so what, what I'm gonna try and do is to kind of really summarize some of the thinking um, that we've reached as, as, as we reflect on the end of the project about what it shows. And you know where, where I've kind of reached with this, and it's important to say, that we've all got slightly different versions of the project, um, but you know, given where we're coming from, given what we're interested in, um, but this is kind of my version of it, which I think aligns with what was said in the previous webinars in the in this series, but also emphasizes slightly different things. So the four things that I would highlight um, at the moment is first of all, the, an undergraduate degree is about seeing the world from inside bodies of knowledge. But actually, that process of doing an undergraduate degree takes you inside knowledge, perhaps in the way that school education doesn't, where you're studying knowledge from the outside. But actually, an undergraduate degree is about going inside knowledge and then viewing the world from that pers the perspective of that knowledge, seeing how knowledge claims are made and validated, in our case, as scientists and engineers, and what the world looks like when you view the world as a chemist or a chemical engineer. Um, and then the important thing that then those different bodies of knowledge look different, and make the world look different. Um, and then thirdly, crucially for us, the students who manage to get inside the knowledge, who see the world from the inside of chemistry or from the inside of chemical engineering, they tend to say, that was the most important thing they got from studying that subject, that way of engaging with the world. Um, whereas those students who never seem to make it inside the knowledge, never seem to see the world from that perspective, are more likely in the students we've talked to, to be disengaged and either focus on very specific skills or bits of knowledge they gain from their degree or might be unsure. And this is kind of both at the end of their undergraduate degree, but also three years post-graduation. And then finally, yeah, and this goes a bit beyond our data, but, but a sense that actually, and I'll give an example of this um, towards the end, that actually, you know, for most of our students, they do see the world differently, but actually on its own, that's not enough to change them. So I'll just work, work my way through, through these points. So when we talk about seeing the world differently, what we've got here are, these are from phenomenographic outcome spaces. Um, so phenomenography is a particular way of analyzing data. But what I want to emphasize here is if we start on the left-hand side with chemistry, these are the different ways in which students saw chemistry. The idea is that it forms an inclusive hierarchy with the fifth one, including all the others. being more intrusive. So what happens when things are mixed in a lab to seeing chemistry as a way of seeing chemical reactions, to seeing chemistry is about learning about molecular interactions, then explaining mo molecular interactions, and then explaining those interactions on familiar situations. And hopefully you can see how 
each subsequent way of thinking about chemistry includes the one before, but adds more. And what we found is generally over the course of students' degrees in chemistry, they tended to see chemistry in a more inclusive way by the end of their degree. Then on the right-hand side, chemical engineering, you know, the first thing to say is more so than chemistry for a number of students, and I think for, for one or two students right at the end of their degree, they still couldn't say what chemical engineering was. That sense of what is this thing called chemical engineering Particularly in the first year, lots of students studied with, but even after three years of studying, some students found that really hard um, to talk about. But then beyond that, then first of all, chemical engineering being the application of chemistry to a large scale, so kind of a version of chem chemistry and chem chemical engineering, almost kind of tautologous. Then a shift to focusing on the processes of large scale production. Then the idea, the third one of design coming in, then that this is about the design of multi-scaler processes rather than just all on a single scale, and then that being related to a particular situation. And again, over the course of their chemical engineering degrees, students tended to um, see chemical engineering more towards three, four, or five. And what we would say for both those outcome spaces is that by the end of a degree in chemistry or chemical engineering, you you know, you want students to get to at least three, you know, to at least see chemistry as about molecular interactions or to see chemical engineering about design. So, you know, in, in, in some versions of the literature that's called the watershed conception. So two things, well, three things to say about that. So first of all, it goes back to Jenny's point about the ways in which these closely related areas actually move students in different directions. They both start with chemistry, but then they go on different journeys. So, so chemistry for the students becomes about developing general explanations in unknown situations, but it's about general explanations. Whereas chemical engineering becomes about design for particular contexts. So you have this real contrast of one being about generally explaining and the other being about designing for particular. And so we would argue this shows how these closely related fields actually prepare students to engage in the world in different ways. So I'm going to shift now to focus on chemical engineering, just, just to say a few things more. And part of the reasons for that is that in previous presentations, we've tech, well, certainly the ones I've done, I've tended to focus on chemistry. So I just wanted to correct that. So I talked in the beginning about these inside outside views of chemical engineering or chemistry, where the students manage to see it in the inside and outside. So I've got two final year chemical engineers from the same university talking about how they saw chemical engineering to try to um, illustrate this distinction. So with Robert, you know, he's saying it's in every facet of life, like it's just there from medicine, you know, from your medicine to the water you drink, the clothes you, you wear, literally anything you see, you know, that's chemical engineering. It's how we interpret the systems we use. And for me, this quote and other aspects of Robert's interviews give this real sense of how Robert sees chemical engineering and uses it to see the world through chemical engineering. Whereas in contrast, Rabia, in the end of her undergraduate year, kind of really struggles again, still to say what that is, and kind of says, well, it's broad, it incorporates lots of things, not just maths, not just chemistry, but things like safety as well as economics. And for me, there's a real sense here of Robert being on the inside of chemical engineering, looking out of the world, Whereas for Rabia, she's looking in at chemical engineering. She's not seeing it from the inside. So that's the kind of thing. And we see similar things in chemistry of this distinction between students who see it from the inside and other students who still see it as something outside of them, even at the end of their undergraduate year. And then this is the same two students talking about what they gained from studying chemical engineering in the final year interview. So, um, three years after graduating. 
And Robert's talking about how education shapes your thinking, helps you to meet ends and goals because you're good at seeing things from individual standpoints and then working them out to make what you want to happen. You know, again, a sense of the what he's gained from chemical engineering is a way of seeing and engaging with the world. Where contrast that with Rabia, who, you know, seven years into the study is kind of listing bits she picked up, different skills from software, computer software, practical skills in lab. Oh, we covered book reviews as well. And there's just these sense of these bits, these skills, these things she's putting together. There's not a way of engaging with the world that she's gained from her degree. So that for us is kind of really important that, that, that this is what we mean about, this is what an undergraduate degree gives students is this sense of when it works, a way of engaging with the world from the inside the body of knowledge. But I also want to highlight, this is Nina who, who sees within the chemical engineering um, outcome space I said at the beginning, she in her, in her final year undergraduate um, interview, she sees it in terms of five about designing for a particular context. Um, but if we look at her trajectory, it's very interesting. So at the beginning, in her first year at university, she's had a dream of working for the United Nations. She wants to develop things for community, particularly in terms of water purification. Um, you know, Nina's at a South African university, and this was very common in the first year that the students would talk about the importance of water purification, about contributing to South Africa's society, you know, and how the world needs more chemical engineers. By her final year at university, and, and for her that was her fourth year, you know, she's saying, well, it's harder, you know, I hope having a degree makes it easier. Um, but there's still a sense of wanting to help others and come up with new ideas. So, so it's kind of impinged by reality a bit, but there's still a desire to get. And then three years in, in turn, career, she, she's um, working in the mining industry in South Africa. And she says, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do when I finished studying. And I still laugh to myself and think back when I used to say, oh, no, I would never work in the mining industry. And here I am. Um, and then she talks about why it's a good fit. And she's working on the technology side. And actually, she can see if she can optimize processes in mining, then that might help to make a contribution. Now, what I'm not doing here is saying, oh, look, look at look at Nina, how silly to have, have these dreams and then to be hit by reality. What I'm saying is that she has a way of engaging with the world through chemical engineering, but that's not enough on its own to contribute to changing society. And we had a bit of discussion about this in the previous webinar. But actually, yes, we can prepare graduates to go and make a contribution in the world, unless there's structures and ways of supporting them in, in society, then they're very unlikely to be able to find ways of doing it. Because I think I said at the last webinar, it's similar to what universities do, where they say, what we're going to do is we're going to appoint a lot of new lecturers, and we're going to train them in teaching and education, and then they're going to transform the institution. And what those what happens in those cases is that those new lecturers become like the old established lecturers because that's where power and prestige lie. And I think a similar thing happens here. So unless we have structures that help to disrupt and support graduates in disrupting society, then that's unlikely to be a successful strategy. So just quickly, the so what of, of, of these points I've made. So first of all, it really challenges current policy discourses about the important outcomes of undergraduate degrees. So certainly in England, there's a real sense that we can measure the quality of a degree by students' employment outcome. But it's not just in England. If you look at the recent compact that's been launched in Australia and the way that they describe the nature of a university education, within that compact, they use the word skills three times as often as they use the word knowledge. So this sense that what's becoming quite dominant in discourse and also kind of pushed by um, international organizations like the OECD to say, well, really, 
you know, the degree is about human capital. It's about developing skills in certain ways. It's about de developing employability. I think what we'd say based on this project, well, it is, but indirectly. What universities do is they develop these ways of engaging with the world that happen to make you more employable, but that's not what they're trying to do. And if we move to focus on employability or generic skills, we lose the absolutely important ways in which, in which those outcomes are rooted in bodies of knowledge that students engage with in their degrees. And so we get these big movements to interdisciplinarity, to you know, you know, to micro credentials, to putting bits together. And you know, what I've tried to illustrate here is if you bit, put those bits together without taking students inside knowledge, then they don't get the benefit of what a degree is offering. Thirdly, it highlights how what degree programs need to do is to find ways to take their students inside these bodies of knowledge and really think about how do we support that? How do we enable that to happen? And then finally, the point I ended up with with um, the illustration from Nina is that, that you know it's not enough to say to graduates, okay, we'll prepare you for the world and you go and change it. You know, there's a conversation that needs to happen with graduates, with non-graduates, with graduates from many years ago, all coming together to think about how we change society. Whereas if we put all of that responsibility onto the newish, new, newest people who are graduating from university, all we're doing is we're, we're, we're setting them up to fail. So knowledge is powerful. It can change how our graduates engage with the world. If we want to change the world, then there's more that we need to do and more responsibility that universities need to take. So having their amazing list of graduate attributes about what their graduates do in the world is not enough unless they're going to find ways to actually support that and to work with other agencies in society to support. Okay, and I'll stop sharing and we'll move to discussion. Just remember to <laughs> unmute <laughs> and switch on the video. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jenny. That was wonderful. Such an interesting overview also for us who were part of the whole thing to, to get that, um, that wonderful summary. Um, there's an interesting question from Bernard. Uh, could you, do you want to just Unmute yourself and um, let's. Yes, uh, let's have... can, can you hear me? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, um, the, the word longitudinal brought to mind um, William Perry's work on students' intellectual and cognitive development. I just wondered to what extent do these research outcomes mirror or not his work on their intellectual and cognitive development from dualism to multiplicity to relativism to commitment? Um, this, this seems to be particularly um, in year seven, uh, students committed to a certain view of the world. And I just wondered uh, whether there's some parallels here. Yeah, there are definitely high burner, good to see you. Um, then, oh. um, yeah, there's definite parallels, but there's important differences. You know, so, so clearly you can lay like what we're talking about in terms of Paris, um, hierarchy and you know, back from gold is laid to work and those things. But what's importantly different is that sense of this being how this occurs and how it happens and how students see the world being different according to the bodies of knowledge they've engaged. And so if you look at, you know, that's that's what's really important is, is, is it's not the same. And actually it's really important. What we need in society is diversity. You know, we need diversity of people's backgrounds, diversity of people's heritages, but we also need diversity in the ways in which people engage with them. And it's through that diversity that we get powerful ways of engaging with the world. And if we if we lose that sense that actually different engaging with different disciplines allow us to engage with the world differently, then actually we lose, for me, the power of higher education, that sense of a specialist knowledge that you see from the inside 
rather than, and, and you see from inside that knowledge to the world, rather than something that's seen from the outside, which is you know, what school tends to do. And certainly when you get to micro credentials, you know, that's what they offer you. Now, I think once you've been on the inside, I think Mags Blackie was making this point in an earlier seminar, the webinar, is that once you've gone inside that, then actually you can use that to understand, understand different things. And we see that from some of our engineers who end up going into medicine. Um, and, and that also fits with the kind of, most people who do MOOC already have an undergraduate degree. So once you've got a sense of seeing the world from inside the body knowledge, then there's all kinds of things you can do. But having that initial education that a degree offers, where you see the world from inside a particular body of knowledge, I think is really, really important. Yeah, I think that I think that's really important phrase that that phrase inside knowledge within different dif through different disciplinary lenses. Thank you, thank you very much, both of you. Teresa, um, you you gave us a question in the chat. Do you want to just sort of phrase it and and ask the presenters about that? Thanks, Renee. Um, so I was wondering about the, um, I, I understand the perspective on the disciplines, but I was wondering whether that, whether you feel that's true within something like engineering as well. Is it kind of between disciplines like medicine and sociology and engineering? Because sometimes I feel like the disciplines in engineering are, are kind of, for want of a better word, quite arbitrary, sort of based on historical origins of where engineering came from and whether those are even relevant anymore. Do you, do you think that the same is true within within engineering, for example, that we, we need to still have chemical and mechanical disciplines? Or do you think there's scope for more multidisciplinary views of what an engineer is? Go on, Jenny, that's more in your area than mine. Thanks, Teresa. Sorry, I just um, had a slight hiccup here. Um, but I, I think you raise a really important Sorry. question. And, and I think what we would from the position of what we've learned in the study, I think I would support the argument that in order to engage in interdisciplinary work, there's a real strength if you've gone deep in a discipline. Um, and I think, Paul, you actually have made this point more eloquently than me. From, from, that, from that exposure to how knowledge works and going deeply to, from this inside view, to have a way of thinking about the world, um, that is a really strong starting point from which to potentially engage deeply in other disciplines or to engage with other people who are coming from other disciplinary views and indeed to, um, to be able to work at an interdisciplinary level. But I, I don't think, I think there's power in disciplines. And I think with the complexity of knowledge, and if you think also about you know, modes of knowledge generation, I, I do think we owe it to graduate, young undergraduates to give them a very clear grounding and a starting point from a disciplinary home. Paul, do you want to elaborate on that? I'm sure you can. Yeah, I, yeah I mean, I, I mean, I would say in terms of the question about, you know, does, you know, do, do you want, you know, do you need those distinction engineering? I think I, th I think I can Im imagine both, and 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 we have some of our graduates, and and in fact some of the um, academics we talk to talking about how chemical engineering is different from other forms of engineering. Um, but but I think my position is is what you want is experts in each field designing the curricula that they think is best placed for to bring students in inside that knowledge. And it might be that you can have some programs that are don't have those engineering di divisions, other programs that do, and, and there's a richness in that diversity. So, so you know, you know, what what what's important is that people who are expert in those fields use their understanding of their students and their understanding of the knowledge to consciously design the best program they can to bring students on the inside of knowledge. And that can be done in different ways in different contexts, 
but it's you know for me the important question you know it's not the answer of how you do it it's the question of well how are we bringing students inside knowledge and sometimes we'll think we've got it right and it won't work at all you know and and, and we'll try and work with it further so so you know i i i i think it you know it's it's you know, if I, you know, if it was a question about how to design the curricula for higher education researchers, I'd have a much stronger view on it. But that's because it's my field. I think it's the people in those fields to really play the role in, de in deciding in conversation with students and conversation with others about what the really key aspects are to see the world from that perspective. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, the, the logic of the disciplines um, that that's has a, a value of it, uh, almost an intrinsic value. Um, there's an interesting question from Iral about university spaces and, and maybe a possible link, Iral, would you like to explain to us, uh, just give us your question. Hello, hi, um, I'm Hiral Patel, I'm a lecturer at Welsh School of Architecture at Cardiff University. And it was super interesting to hear um, all the insights that, that were being shared. Um, I'm working on a research project where we are looking at if there is any potential relationship between educational out outcomes and university spaces. And I think what, I had a view on it that maybe it's quite complex relationship, uh, but I wanted to, and it's not very easy to, to make a direct correlation. Um, but maybe I would like to hear from uh, from the team if if they have um, any kind of findings that would support um, any such correlations. Thanks, Harald. Go on, Jenny. Are you desperate to say something? I'll kick off again, Paul. We can complete each other's sentences after all these years of working together. I love the question, and I think that's really interesting. So at Virginia Tech, we exactly have that structure of the general uh, engineering first year, which, in fact, my department coordinates. I think I would make two arguments why I would still really endorse that um, structure. And remember, everything's contextual as well. So that's the next question. Which, But... Um, or well, maybe I should argue about the strengths of it, Hiral. I think um, it allows, we're saying that going into a discipline is a deep thing. It's a forming of identity, a way of thinking about the world and offering students who do not get exposure much to this in high school, even in contexts where there's quite a lot of exposure to engineering, like the US, when you get into university to firstly have the space of seeing what's there and strengthening your own choices. So we actually, where I work, um, about 40% of our students actually change their minds from what degree they thought they were going to when they came into of engineering. And partly also because there are many engineering degrees they know less about. You know, they know about some of the big ones. We've got 14 different programs or so when I last counted at Virginia Tech. Um, so that's the one piece, which obviously is a sort of obvious one, use the year to explore. I think another really important thing is we want them to think about engineering as an enterprise, which does involve these different disciplines. And you start to get socialized in this, in, in, in coming into a college where you may be someone who's gonna go off into mechanical engineering, but you've worked with some students who are already getting quite excited about electrical engineering, say, and when you're doing your first year projects, you might even be starting to adopt some of those different um, identities in quite a nascent way. So I think we also expose students to the strength of picking a discipline, but the knowledge that your discipline is not gonna be enough to solve any engineering problems. All engineering problems basically are interdisciplinary, um, all real problems in the world. So, Thank, thanks for that. I do think a really interesting challenge and maybe shout out Nicole's project, another project here is, because of course fourth year, the final year also tends to go a bit interdisciplinary. The middle years, which I used to call the sort of last frontier tend to be very focused in the discipline. And the question would be, is there space in those middle years to still be keeping the broad perspectives? 
Um, I think there are to some degree, but this is these are really important questions for curriculum design. Thanks for that prompt. Thank you, Jenny. I, I think that sort of leads us nicely to a question that Grant has posted in the chat. Um, and you, you gave us a little bit of that where you you um, spoke about what your hopes are as a, as a program leader. And I think Grant's question speaks to just how much do our students pick up on it. And uh, I think Paul is busy uh, finalizing a paper that that might take a bit of a look at you know what um, the, the hopes and the hopes and fears of um, of the program leaders and and whether the students make the connections grant please do you want to kind of um, uh, rephrase my clumsy attempt <laughs> <laughs> uh, indeed uh, thanks Renee and as I said in my question. Nice to see you because we missed you a few weeks ago. Um, but I enjoyed the, the, the talk a few weeks ago that, uh, that Jan gave and that you were supposed to give. Um, but I just couldn't help but think, what's the connection between what Jan was reporting on a few weeks ago about what program leaders think their program is distinctive in and what students pick up at the end? Um, is 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 there a distinctive flavor of the program, an intentional uh, flavor to the program that the, um, the, the, the staff delivering it uh, believe that, uh, that, that they're conveying and believe is distinctive? Is that reflective in, in the students' perceptions? Um, and part of that question is, you know, as, I, as I put it in, in, in the chat, the core of the discipline is you know, fairly well established. So any flavor that we might give it locally, we're pretty constrained on that. We can't change it enormously. So on the one hand, is the core overwhelming such that students don't even notice uh, the local flavor? But the second point I think comes from what Paul was just saying, that students on the same program come out with very different perceptions in any case. And so do the differences between student perceptions overwhelm uh, any particular distinctive uh, that's at the heart of the program. So I think there's, you know, I think it would be nice to think that we're producing students that are distinctive in some way, but I think it would be easy for that distinctiveness to be overwhelmed by other factors. And I'm just wondering if there was any correlation between what Jan was talking about a few weeks ago and what Paul's been talking about today. Yeah, thank, thanks, Graham. Good to see you. Um... And, and, and as, as um, Rennie mentioned, that, that, that's the kind of paper that I'm, I'm leading on the writing of at the moment, um, looking at, partly looking at different ways students understand that, but also looking at whether that relates to the kind of intentions that Jan was talking about. And certainly it's not anything as um, uh, strong as a correlation. I, th I think, you know, I think, I think what, what you, you know, what, what I would say is, is I think within our, within the six chemical engineering degree programs, we can probably see three different ways um, of, of approaching chemical engineering kind of in the way we're looking at the moment. One is kind of very much focused around the elements of being chem chemical engineer. Another, which is related, but, but it is different, really focuses on the competences of being an engineer. And the final one focuses very much on the ways of seeing a chemical engine. And what we find, you know, we're still doing this analysis, is, is that across all of those, students develop an understanding of chemical en engineering um, that kind of cross the, the, that variation that I showed. Um, but but I, think, I think, and I'm being a bit tentative deliberately, but I think some of those strategies might be more high risk than others. So I think I think the curricula that the, the you know where the program leaders talk about how they really emphasize the ways of seeing of the chemical engineer, you know, the, there's some indication that for a number of students, they really get that and it makes complete sense to them and they they really get that way of seeing. Whereas for others, other students. They just never get quite what that means. 
and they, you know, and you know, and so, for example, where the competence of, of an engineer are emphasised, you know, I think maybe students find that easier to grasp in terms of the way they've seen chemical engineering. Now that doesn't mean I'm certainly not saying one's better than the other. I think you know all of those different ways of approaching it have different benefits and different risks, and it's about curriculum choice. And I, I know as you've argued in your own work, you know, given the potential size of the chemical engineering curriculum, what you want the programs that, that are different from each other and can offer different kinds of things. So, so I think that that's the kind of space where, where, where we would see this paper going it is, is saying, look, what we want to do is to, is, is to help to find ways that take students inside of chemical engineering to see the world, recognize there are these different ways of doing it that, have, that present different challenges and, and, and different benefits in the, in, the, in the way that it happens. And whilst that kind of sounds dreadfully wishy-washy as I say it, you know, for me, that's crucial to leave the space for, you know, um, program leaders and, and program teams to design a program they really believe in. Because that commitment to a program and doing it in a way that you think gives students the best access to understanding chemical engineering and science chemistry, that to me is the most important thing, that you have a, that you have a sense of a commitment to a way of doing chemical engineering or a way of doing chemistry. Thanks, Paul. I think that uh, last point is really important and, and, and valuable. Um, it's a little bit like, when I used to teach assessment, my goal wasn't to teach how to assess, it was to cultivate a sense of commitment to assessing well, because the commitment to doing it well is more important than the particular ways that you do. Um, but you know, I will look forward to seeing that paper and, and, and seeing uh, what, what you come out with. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say was to thank you, Jenny, for, um, for pushing this towards chemistry and chemical engineering in the first place. Uh, I think that they are a particularly interesting um, pair of, of uh, disciplines to be to be looking at. But I also just I'm really grateful that such a large project from such such a team happened to choose chemi chemistry and chemical engineering for its focus. Um, and we are the richer for that because this could easily have, you know, gone somewhere else. Um, and so I'm really grateful that chemistry and chemical engineering will both um, benefit from the attention that's been given to it in this way. So thank you all for that. Thank you, Grant. Thanks, Paul, Jenny. Um, I see we have two minutes left. I don't know if we can squeeze in. There's a, there's a, a, a question from Lara asking, I'm just going to paraphrase it so that we can maybe get a quick quick takeaway from each of you about some notable differences that you found, that we found uh, across the country contexts. Um, I think that's a, a tricky one, <laughs> but uh, we'll leave it to, to Jenny and Paul to, to uh, give a bash. Indeed. So lots to say, and maybe just to tell everyone here, Paul is leading on a book that will draw together everything from this project. So what you don't get in these next two minutes. And then I want to be very nuts and bolts and just say one, I've been very interested in the differences. Um, I think there's a big take home for the South Africans in this project. So we, uh, Ashish led, led on an analysis looking at how many hours in the week are scheduled in what we could call contact time for students and the South Africans do a lot more teaching. <laughs> South African engineering students, especially, we were comparing the engineers there, um, are spending nearly 50% more time in the week in classes. And I do think that there's a very nice challenge to, um, to the South African program leaders. Um, Ashish's paper shows how that does influence students evolving learning and thinking about the different discipline and in some ways in adverse ways when all they're trying to do is just manage an impossible time challenge so I think I'll stop but I there's many things to say but I do want to flag that and I believe that paper is just published Paul over to you 
Yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, I, you know, my, my sense is that 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 what's really interesting is is whether they were studying chemistry or chem chemical engineering seems to shape the differences more than the institutional or national settings. But there are some some things that are different. So as I kind of mentioned in passing before, you know, many more of the South African students in both chemistry and chemical engineering come in with a commitment to change society. It's not clear where that goes, but certainly that is something that the students in their first year interviews talk about far more in the South African data than the US and, and the English. It doesn't mean they don't in those countries. It's just a, a significant number of South African um, first year undergraduates do. The other thing that I think is noticeable is within the US system, because you you have more model and, and, and also in South Africa, but to a lesser extent, certain data I've seen, is you have a model in the US where you might, you do your undergraduate degree and then you might do a postgraduate degree in medicine or dentistry or something else. And you do get a number of students who their undergraduate degree is something to get to. They've got to get the credit, they've got to get through it. They're really not that bothered about engaging with this way of seeing because in the end, it's about going on to their postgraduate study. And that, you know, that that is far more in the um, US data interviews than it is the others. Again, it's not it's not the majority of students at all, but it's certainly a kind of, yeah, it's it's, it's certainly um, more clearer there than it is um, for for the English and South African data. But, you know what what's lovely and what's throughout all these accounts is 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 how much the education matters to the students, what they're doing. And, and you know, and for me, the really important thing I would emphasize, and again, you know, which I think is very problematic the way both universities and governments talk about doing a degree, is how important it is for students to understand it as a process of education. How much that sense of that they're going to be changed by this process and they need to be up that process really plays out. If, if, if they feel they can do it without going through that, then they end up with these kind of bitty skills versions of the higher edu education experience rather than something that actually allows them to engage with the world in a different way. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share a little bit of our project. As um, Jenny mentioned, there's a book on the way um, and um, we look forward, we've got data that could keep us going for many years. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to, to sharing more with you over time. Thank you for, for being such an engaging audience. Lovely questions that we had. It took the seminar, the webinar further, and um, we really value your time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>